Apologize. Big P values imply your data falls within. Do you remember? Remember that confidence interval? There's a confidence interval around the null, whether it's 95 or also. I like 95. Let's go with that. There's a confidence interval on that null curve. A big P value means you fell within it, which means you fell within what you were expecting. Nothing to write home about. Right? Mom, I'm still breathing. Nothing to write home about. I mean, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Large p-values are generally those greater than, and this is where I go, tie back to that, it's about big, generally bigger than 5%. That's the, that's the, that's the I forget the word now, the, uh, the norm, the status quo, sure. Sometimes you want to change that, and it's, that, it's funny because research methods classes don't talk about that a whole lot. I do want to talk about it with you guys later, not today, later. Cool so far? Those are big p-values. Generally, big p-values are not the ones you read about in the papers, though. Small ones are the ones you read about in the papers. So small ones. Less than 5% is generally the cutoff, although we'll see why sometimes it's not always less than 5%. A measurable effect. Oh, yes, measurable effect. That's the kicker. How do you measure it? Don't worry about that right now. All these studies we're looking at today and Thursday are, have already been measured for you. We're just looking at the results. Promise, we'll get into the measurements. Back half of the course, that's all, that's what it's all about is to look at the measurements. Okay, small p-values apply the two pieces of the conditional probability do what? Let's look at this example. Caffeine has no lowering effect on heart rate during some max. That's what we're going assuming, right? Build the curve around that. And then what did our data say? Ah, it lowered it. So what do the two hands do to each other? They contradict it. I love that. They contradict it. Use that word. It's a good one. They contradict each other. What did you say, Elizabeth? They re you reject the null. Yes. You reject the null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis is this. Your data does not support it. You reject it. Or you say that caffeine lowered the heart rate. And then the next question, of course, is... Okay. Why? I was going, I was going with your why question. <laughs> then we got to go find out why. <laughs> then we start looking at it physiologically. How much has been answered by the fact that this is less than 5%? It's obviously enough to trigger it out of that confidence interval. So it's, it's, now we got to ask our question, why did caffeine do that? Was it a fluke? Is it replicable? Yeah? Is it replicable? Can we do this experiment again with nine other dudes and have similar results? Because if you can't, that's when you start getting papers pulled and, oh, you got a type 1 error. It happens. This stuff happens. This is why we measure error. So, but the question is, at this point, what does the less than 5% mean? That's all I want to worry about now. We'll get to the why as we go through later in the class, of course. All right, big idea continued. Me has a measurable effect. Small p-values imply your data falls outside of... That confidence interval of the null, Brandon, we've built that confidence interval around the null hypothesis, and a small p-value means you're outside of it. It means you escaped it. If you've escaped the interval, that means you're somewhere else more likely than in the interval. You're in somebody else's interval. Oh, more about that momentarily. More about that momentarily. Oh, yes, just good stuff. Generally less than? Yeah, I'm going to give you the answer up there, less than 5%. It's kind of a silly thing to put twice. I apologize. Precious little math to do today. I would argue that no math will be done today. Or maybe even Thursday. We'll get back to the math, I promise. There's even less math in this course than in 243. And there wasn't much in that course. But it's all about the interpretation of what the p-values are telling you and the limitations of that conclusion because it might be wrong. That's the other thing, too. You got it, you got it. How many people, when they test positive for a grave disease, roll over and give up? It's possible that is a false positive test, yes? Or for a drug test. How many people, if they're, if they're super clean and test positive for a drug, say, oh, well, take my job, I don't want it anyway. If you know it's a false positive, there are measures you can take to analyze. Why did it come back positive, right? Was there a marker? Was it something you did the day you took that test that triggered the positive test result? Just realize that when a test comes back positive, it is not 100% certain. Just like when it comes back negative, it's not 100% certain. There's always uncertainty. No math necessary for today to analyze that. We're going to analyze it today as, as we talk. Does that make sense, Tyler? You the man. All right. So if you would, friends, it's about 9 o'clock. Let's take our five and also read the next article in your, in your, uh, on your uh, little handout here, the, the, the front and back with the color, the green tea and prevention, prevention of breast cancer. It starts, in the, it starts on page one and flips over to about half of page two. 
So take five, read the article, we'll reconvene.